The shooting range. As this episode is being released on the channel, update 1.97 is also very close to going live. That means it's time to take a quick look at the new machines in our hangars, discover new locations, and find out about other various things that update Viking Fury brings to the game. In this episode, Pages of History, one day of Walter Holden's life. Map Guide, a new map for tank battles. And Metal Beasts, the one that started the whole Swedish tank industry. With update Viking Fury, more than three dozen Swedish tanks and SPGs entered the game at full speed. We'll be talking about them in future episodes of The Shooting Range, but we'd like to start with a light tank created under the leadership of the outstanding designer Otto Merka. Not only did this machine lay the foundation for Sweden's own tank industry, but it also proved to be very successful on its own. Meet the Strav M31. In the game, the tank is ranked at a battle rating of 1.0. This is one of two reserve machines that lead us into the Swedish tech tree. At first glimpse, it's not very different from the reserve machines of other nations. Average mobility, penetrating gun, thin armor. Quite an unexpected set for this rank. But an attentive player will find a little surprise here, which we'll talk about a bit later on. The tank is armed with a 37mm semi-automatic cannon with elevation angles from minus 10 to plus 25 degrees, and two machine guns with a caliber of 6.5mm. One is paired with the gun, while the other one is placed in the hull and is controlled by a separate gunner. The driver is adjacent to him, and two more crew members sit in the turret. Behind their backs and to their sides, we see the ammo while the rear part is almost entirely occupied by a 200 horsepower engine. The transmission provides the speed of up to 42 km per hour while going forward, and, uh, this is the promised surprise, almost 19 kph in reverse. But there's more. While the average protection of the tank is about 24 mm from all sides, the rear part is protected by two spaced 20 mm armor plates. What can we make of this in terms of tactics? We mean attacking your enemies backwards sounds a bit silly, doesn't it? Well, you'll be surprised, but why not? All jokes aside, the back of the tank is structurally better protected than the sides and the frontal part of the hull. There are two layers of armor, plus a massive engine, and both the ammo and the crew are far away from it. Of course, you shouldn't be driving around backwards at all times. First, that's just absurd. Second, you won't be able to get anywhere in time. And third, your teammates will definitely start mocking you. But turning your back on the enemy in the midst of a battle is not a bad idea, especially if you haven't used your fire extinguisher yet. In addition, your decent reverse speed will allow you to confidently maneuver you just have to adjust yourself and not confuse left with right, and going forward with going backwards. In all other ways, the gameplay on the M31 is quite typical of early light tanks. When it comes to shells, your primary choice is the APHE one. Its penetration is quite enough to pierce most of your opponents at this rank in the front, and 15 grams of explosives detonating inside the enemy combat compartment are more valuable than an extra 4 mm of point-blank penetration. In the next episode of The Shooting Range, we will return to this tank in our pages of history and recall the origins of the unique Swedish tank-building tradition. And now, let's talk about a curious case involving another new machine of the fresh update.
The year was 1966. The sound of rock and roll accompanied by deafening whistles of the phantoms was setting the mood for the infernal disco in the jungle of Vietnam. The long-suffering Kashmir was overwhelmed by religious strife. The Middle East was almost on fire and about to explode. The Soviet Union was chanting, Hands of Cuba! The Cultural Revolution was raging in China, which, by the way, had just joined the nuclear club, and one wouldn't even want to think of the atrocities happening in Africa. So, Walter Holden, an air engineer of the UK's Royal Air Force, needed to hurry. At any moment, Soviet bombers armed with nukes could begin their attack, or at least that's what was considered very probable in that day and age. The flying time from the moment of the Brits' discovery to the cities of the United Kingdom was a little more than 10 minutes. So the latest English electric lightning interceptors had to be at full combat alert day and night. They were the only ones capable of taking off, gaining altitude, and intercepting the enemy quickly enough. But this one lightning with the tail number XM135 didn't want to work normally and Holden had to fix it really quickly. The plane's instruments were failing, but only on takeoff. The rest of the time they worked just perfectly. The ideal scenario would be to put a qualified pilot in the cockpit, simulate the lightning going into takeoff mode, and then take readings at that moment. The problem was that the pilot was scheduled to arrive only a week later at best, and the plane was supposed to enter combat duty about… <laughs> yesterday. What was he to do? Climb into the cockpit himself? Well, it seemed like the only choice he had. Okay. Start the engine. Short run. Everything is fine. Again. And again. No malfunctioning instruments. The plane seemed to mock the engineer. Well then, one more time. For the third try, the lightning suddenly jumped up and began to rapidly gain speed instead of smoothly rolling forward. Apparently, Holden pushed the engine control handle too hard, and it switched to afterburner mode. In addition, the damned handle got fixed in the takeoff position. The frightened engineer couldn't immediately remember how to unlock it, and by the time he did, the mighty interceptor had already reached takeoff speed. There weren't a lot of options. He could either roll out of the strip at 300 kph, crash and burn, or take off. Obviously, Walter Holden chose the second one. He had no flight suit or helmet with an intercom in it, which meant that he was left without communication. There was no parachute. And <laughs> where would a flight engineer get one anyway? So ejection wasn't possible either. The only way to stay alive was to land the plane at any cost. Of course, as an aviation engineer, he had some flight experience <laughs> on a training biplane which was similar to an ultra-modern jet fighter, roughly in the same manner as a kick scooter is similar to a racing car. Nevertheless, Holden tested the controls, and having made sure that they reacted quite well, made a turn heading back to the airfield. He began to decline, but miscalculated the speed, and had to go for another attempt. Meanwhile, downstairs panic reigned, Having finally realized what was happening, the ground services were hastily pulling planes out of the way, preparing for the worst, and Holden was quickly mastering the piloting of a completely new machine. The third approach was particularly successful. He even managed to release the landing flaps to slow down, but his skills let him down a bit. Before that, on his own, he had only landed an aircraft with a tail wheel, so he pulled the nose up too much, simply out of habit. The lightning's tail hit the concrete at the moment of touch, causing the failure of the brake parachute. But nevertheless, luck did smile at the engineer that day. The runway was a long enough, the brakes worked properly, so the plane began to slow down and finally, reluctantly, stopped. After that, Holden received a huge dose of sedatives in the medical unit, a trial, and complete absolution. The engineer indeed was obeying the order to repair the aircraft and was doing everything in his power to do so. 
and he was certainly not responsible for the fact that he wasn't provided with a pilot to conduct tests. Soon, the story leaked to the press, and a few days later, Walter Holden woke up famous, which, however, didn't please him at all, because the instruments of the damned lightning with the tail number XM-135 still didn't work properly. Cozy streets, recognizable European architecture, wooden shutters, vintage trams, lampposts, shops, ateliers, and wild stone embankments. The update Viking Fury brings a beautiful Scandinavian map for tank battles into the game. Let's look at Sweden. We'll have plenty of time to enjoy the beauties of this region more than once, but for now, Let's look at the new location from the tactical perspective. Point A is on the right flank and is equally suitable for both teams. Tanks with well-protected turrets will be especially effective here. The fact is that there are many covers around the point, allowing you to hide and get your gun ready. For example, you can stand behind this shrub or those concrete blocks next to the building. In addition, you can use gaps between the concrete blocks as loopholes, which is extremely useful for defense purposes. And if your elevation angles are good enough, then the ascent to the point, which is a bit uplifted, will become an excellent firing position as well. To the right of A, there's an open promenade, ready to host lots of long-distance skirmishes, and the yards in squares C6 D6 and E6 give space for flanking maneuvers, so control over them can often be even more important than over the point itself. Moving to point B, it's located in the very center of the map in a small square surrounded by buildings. There are only four entrances to it, which plays into the hands of its potential defenders. This point can be held by just a handful of well-coordinated players so it's definitely not worth sitting there with your old team. Better cover all possible detours around it on lines 3 and 5. They are equally important for both teams. Since points A and B can be comfortably defended, the advantage will obviously go to the team that manages to capture them first. This is where fast light tanks will come in handy, as they're able to get to the capture point within the first minute of the battle and numerous covers will help them hold their ground until the slower allies show up. Finally, the point C on the left flank is quite isolated. There are more covers and intersections, and the streets are narrower than on the rest of the map. This slightly slows down your movement and also makes it more risky. There is always a chance to run into an enemy ambush. For the lower team, the safest route runs along the roads through the squares E1 and F1 with the subsequent capture of the point. And for those who start from the top, there are two options. Either move in through the shortest path or pave the way through square D3. The second option makes it possible to intercept those reckless players who decide to go straight to the point across the square. Plus you'll be able to destroy the slower enemy tech before entering the capture point. Write us in the comments what you think of the new map, and in the meantime, we'll answer some of your questions. The first message was sent by a player called Sebastian. What's the vehicle with the most polygons in War Thunder? All our vehicles are carefully optimized. There isn't one that we can clearly distinguish in that sense. But if we were to name a certain class of tech, that would be the ships, the big ones. There are lots of small details in those. Cotton Lum asks, how can you find out whether or not your shot will pierce the armor of the enemy 
at the angle the armor is. And how do you know if you will survive a shot by angling? There's a feature called Protection Analysis that we've created and recently reworked just for that. You can find it in your hangar by clicking on Armor. There, you can study the enemy machines in great detail by shooting at them with rounds of your choosing from various directions. And by shooting at your machine, you can understand the most effective angles for your own protection. Then, there is a question sent by Jonathan Rosenberg. Can we expect to see more supersonic jets in the future? <laughs> sure you can. We regularly add new supersonic jets in new updates, and we don't plan on stopping anytime soon. Another question comes from Harvey Inc. Which bomber can carry the most explosive mass in the game? We've already had a similar question sometime last autumn. Today, the record is still held by the Soviet Tu-4 bomber. It can carry four Fab 3000 bombs, each weighing 2,983 kilograms. That makes almost 12 tons of bomb load. And the last message for today was written by Death Machine Ept. Infantry confirmed! Okay, let's make it clear once again so that nobody gets confused. No, we are not planning on introducing infantry into the game. The guys that you occasionally see in our Pages of History section are foot soldiers from our other projects that we ask to join our filming sessions for old friendship's sake. Well, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. Come on, you lot, subscribe to the channel, click the bell, and leave a like. And do tell us what you think in the comments below. The Shooting Range premieres every Sunday at 4pm GMT or noon Eastern Time. See you in a week.